the jazz fans go to the store, they purchase my CDs, they unwrap them, they open it up, and they play the music. Not understanding, perhaps, how much work has gone into making these CDs. Hours and hours and hours spent on composing the music, mixing the music, recording the music, finding the musicians to play with. It's a long process, and I would say one CD takes about a year to develop. So in unwrapping the process, unwrapping the CD. So after opening up the CD, most people don't know what it takes to make a CD, which is the recording session. And man, this involves the engineers checking all of their equipment, setting up the correct micage uh, to capture the actual quality of the instrument. It also involves the musicians checking uh, their instruments, you know, the functionality of the instruments and uh, making sure, of course, that they're in tune because we all have to play together. And in this instance, in December of 2018, I'm recording with a uh, woodwind and brass orchestra. And so this takes special techniques for the classical musicians that they are, wonderful musicians that they are. They still have to do uh, their exercises, their scales, and uh, because they have the written note they'll be reading. Uh, the jazz musicians um, have a little bit more flexibility because we're improvising uh, and, and not reading <laughs> the written note except for the uh, melodies and the heads. It's an exciting process, uh, one that the consumer doesn't understand once, again, you know, as I said in the beginning, opening up the CD, Here's the music. What does it take to make this music work? And it takes a lot of uh, practice. It takes a lot of rehearsal time, but uh, it's an enjoyable process and one in which we all love doing. Yeah, sometimes there's awkward moments that uh, are actually humorous. You know, we're all trying to do our best, but uh, we have to communicate, and sometimes there's miscommunications, you know. Sometimes we play when we're not, we shouldn't, and, and we don't when we should. That's life. Should be. 
been in by that time. He didn't know. He didn't know. I, th it, we I have no idea. I know you didn't. I know, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't let you in on our little jazz secret. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to buy you a frozen yogurt. <laughs> <laughs> Have any of you ever tried the frozen yogurt? Frozen yogurt? Yeah. No. It's amazing. I'll take you out. <laughs> I, will, I, will, I will be waiting for it. <laughs> frozen yogurt. It's the best. Incredible. Mm. Uh. Here's a photo of my mother's family. A couple of years after they left Smilla, Ukraine, and arrived in New York. This balloon in the sky probably defines my feeling uh, when I visited Smilla for the very, very first time. But after arriving, uh, I met people and, and, and uh, they seemed very gracious and very nice. Um, yeah, still inside of me, there was a little space of loneliness and isolation, but soon I met people like Larissa, who ran the museum, uh, people from the city hall. I visited the mayor, the mayor's office, and met Sergey, who's the head of the uh, Jazz Federation. Also a school where uh, my ancestors had gone to, and we formed a relationship and, and went out and had something to eat and some coffee. And the television was always there filming me. <laughs> Come on, Natasha, I can't smile forever. It's a video. <laughs> oh, it's a video, okay. Yeah, I'm planting the tree now that you just saw me looking at. Each year that I came to Smilla, I would uh, see the growth of the tree and the improvement in the tree. That was quite an experience. Um, here you see the tree actually in bloom. And, um, you know, it was exciting for me to go see where my mother was raised as a child. I know that she was just a couple of blocks from the old railway station. I'm checking it out, looking in the windows, seeing what I can see. I check the doors to see if I might be able to go in. They're locked. But this is the area in which my mom, my Uncle Boris, and my Aunt Becky, my grandmother, lived. And um, according to my Uncle Boris, they lived two blocks from the railway station and they made um, butter in the back end of their, uh, of their house. Uh, this is a birth hospital where my mom was born. And it's just a birth hospital, just that, just for, for um, mothers to give birth to their children. You know, I'm sitting, I'm contemplating, trying to put myself in um, oh, the feeling of what, what it was like during that time. My mom and uh, my grandmother and my Uncle Boris and Becky, Aunt Becky, immigrated to the United States, I think it was like 1917, because my mom was just a young girl at that time. And uh, she had told me stories about Smilla. As a young child growing up, you know, you wondered what this looked like. And, um, you know, my roots are in the Ukraine. Uh, my dad's family, um, his history uh, has his, his great, great grandfather was from the Ukraine born in the Ukraine. My mom certainly was born in the Ukraine, so I have Ukrainian roots. I look in the windows, I look at the structure of this birth hospital, just trying to, in my mind, wonder what this is all about. Um, fortunately, Larissa had some um, photos here. She runs the museum in um, 
Bismillah. And she's been so helpful in, in providing photos of possible homes that my mom lived in. And it's exciting for me to sit there and look through some of these photographs. She's a very organized person, very lovely person. And um, it would have been hard, very difficult to deal with all of this without her help and, and her support. Is it Moshna? Moshna. I'm trying to communicate with Larissa in her language. I think I made her happy. <laughs> I'm signing one of my albums uh, for Sergey and even trying to write a message uh, in his language. So after several trips to Smela, I've gained a lot of friends, a lot of people that I've come to really love. The symbol of peace is truly important these days because it's a broken world and there's so much animosity and cruelty. Smilla stands for peace. Smilla is a city filled with gentle people. I have come to enjoy the friendship of so many of these wonderful people and even the statue that is the woman breaking the arrow, breaking the conflict. It's it's a wonderful to be here in Smila. And I have met so many wonderful Ukrainian musicians, really, truly gifted artists. It's been an honor and a pleasure to play with all of them. I remember being in New York uh, recording Star Dance. I think it was about 1977, something like that. And uh, I, I won't mention the studio's name, but uh, it was the album I was doing with um, uh, Steve Gadd was on it, and John Stoll, Paul McCandless, Ralph Towner. Was Ralph on it? I'm not sure. But anyways, I was in a separate booth with my acoustic bass, and I was taking a solo, and right in the middle of my solo, this big rat comes out between my legs, and I'm, I'm watching this and soloing at the same time. I thought, well, nah, you get another, another studio next time. <laughs> That's New York. <laughs>
sometimes when I'm in a foreign country uh, playing music and, and some of the musicians may not understand English very well, it can set up kind of an, kind of an awkward but yet humorous situation. Где? На его коробочке? На коробочке, а на входе. На входе самого с контрабаса, на входе в примочку. He wants you to do something in your equipment. I can show you. I can translate this. I can show what you should do. If you go with me, we will, yeah. Deep South Blues, take two. Um, Alec, make sure he doesn't erase the other one. Make sure, ask him, don't erase the other take. I have a new uh, bass, a new homage bass that uh, Herman Arlocker has just made for me. And I've played it in a recording session, also practicing on it, and I'm becoming very comfortable with it. It sounds really, really good. It's got a very unique design. It's very light, easy to travel with. Um, really a very unique instrument. Uh, innovative in many, many ways. I love it. So Herman Erlocker just finished making a brand new instrument for me. This is uh, probably called the Homage 2, right? Yes. Tell me about it. How did you make this? <laughs> My first, first idea for, for some different instrument was uh, to bring uh, the big cup on a place on the instrument was uh, have a vibration like a dot of uh, classical uh, western guitar, an arch of jazz guitar or a double bass. Uh -huh. This was the first idea and I work and find out uh, some piece with the big cup on there, this make a, a, a vibration like, like a, a top of an acoustic instrument. It sounds incredible and it's light. I think the, the, the bass and the case and the stand is under 12 pounds. So it's, a, it's an amazing instrument, the homage to. And my dear friend Herman, thank you. Thank you for this wonderful instrument. I just got through so uh, so uh, David this uh, situation oh yeah if you want I must make the, the actually I'm shooting right now these th this is Herman airlocker on the right Gerhard Watzig. on the left who is one of the great photographers in this camera. What is this camera, Gerhard? Nikon, yeah? D4. Oh, wow, it's amazing. Not the US, but the best. <laughs> <laughs>
and the bass at the same time. So uh, there's a funny incident that happened when I was in Japan several years ago. I uh, was sitting at my bass practicing and at that time I wore no shoes, no socks. I always recorded and played in my bare feet. And uh, I was playing the bass and playing the shakuhachi at the same time. It probably looked very unusual. Um, I was making a recording with Hosan Yamamoto, who is one of the premier shakuhachi players in the world. He has played for the emperor and he's like the most famous shakuhachi player in uh, Japan. He walks in the studio, very proper like, and sees this American with bare feet up in the air uh, and holding a shakuhachi in one hand, a homemade shakuhachi, uh, not as elegant as his shakuhachis, and playing the bass at the same time. And he, he had been talking with someone and he stopped and just stared at me. I'll never forget this. His eyes got big. And then he fell to the ground laughing, uncontrollable. Just laughing and laughing and laughing. Thought it was the funniest sight he had ever seen. And the next day when he came to the studio, he brought me one of his shakuhachis as a gift. <laughs> he says, here's a proper shakuhachi. <laughs> it was a funny, funny moment. Hey, what an absolutely beautiful autumn day. It's October here in Podobrady, and I just returned from Kiev from recording uh, a wonderful CD with uh, three other great Ukrainian musicians. And uh, it was a wonderful time. I'm back now in the Czech Republic, and uh, I'm going to continue riding my bike. Take care. Here. It really is quite amazing.